Hello once again everybody. We are going to be talking a little bit about the midpoint rule in this video. Um, in the Larson textbook, um, the midpoint rule is mentioned at the tail end of section 4.2 in uh, most all of the recent editions. And uh, it's sort of uh, presented as an afterthought in the textbook, uh, as you wouldn't see it until you got into the exercise sets. Um, oh, somewhere uh, pretty deep, deep into it around the uh, uh, in the 70s, problems that are in the numbered 70s. And it turns out that the midpoint formula is a, a, a pretty integral part of, no pun intended, of uh, the process of finding the areas under curves in an approximate fashion. And it's very easy to work with, uh, although the, the formula that you might see here in front of you seems to, to say otherwise. But um, Let's talk about the components of the formula and then get to an example and, and see if we can uh, get some clarity on the uh, midpoint rule. It's hoped that up until this point that uh, everyone understands who's watching the video the, the, the role of the B minus A over N, how he serves as the width of a particular uh, representative rectangle. Uh, if that is something that um, you're still not quite sure about, you might want to watch one of the other videos that I have posted about finding left endpoint approximations or right endpoint approximations. Um, if you look at the contents within the function, that's when things get a little bit out of hand with the midpoint formula. You can see that you have the component b minus a over n, again the width times the counter i, which is a, a pretty typical thing that we see uh, when we do a right endpoint approximation. And then Again, we see it paired up with the b minus a over n width multiplied by i minus 1, which is a typical approach for the left endpoint approximation. Well, it probably seems pretty clear at this point that we would add the left and the right, divide by 2, and that would probably get us something right in the middle. And that's why we call this the midpoint uh, approximation method. Uh, you're essentially averaging the two values that would be on the left side and the right side of your representative rectangle. And that's essentially where this formula comes from. And in the particular Larson textbook that we use and other textbooks as well, they would sometimes simplify things a little bit by just calling the b minus a over n times i just x sub i, which is just some value of x that lies along the x-axis that would serve as a potential right endpoint of a rectangle. Uh, there are many of them. That's why it has a subscript of i that's counting itself from 1 to n. So you have n number of rectangles. And then we will call the other component x sub i minus 1 for simplicity's sake. Well, most often in the exercises, and I can assure on the AP, uh, AB exam as well, you're going to be using the midpoint rule in a very numeric setting. Now, what I mean by that is that it will be very clear how many rectangles or sub-intervals you'll be dealing with. In this case, the number is 5. And because of that 5 being a relatively small number, we can do the sort of the, the crunching of the numbers, so to speak, and figure out exactly what we're going to have with this particular situation. So, that being said, we can move down to example one and start taking a look at this. We are using the graph of negative x squared plus five. Perhaps I didn't make that real clear, but you can see that that indeed is the function. And I'm gonna rewrite that down here in just a moment. F of x is equal to negative x squared plus five. We've already stated that we have five rectangles. N will be five. And we also know the fact that we are going to be utilizing the interval zero to two. Zero to two. In some of my other videos, I have used the same interval. In fact, I've used the same exact function, f of x, only um, having the students do left endpoint and right endpoint approximations. Now, because of the choice of the interval 0 to 2, when you look at my graph where I've already sketched negative x squared plus 5, I'm going to have us use the uh, partitions here along the x-axis to represent the width of the rectangles that I'm using. So I'm going to go ahead 
and sort of apply or lay down a strip that just simply connects the curve to those partitioned points along the x-axis. And you can count them up, and indeed we do have five. One, two, three, four, five. In fact, we can even label a rectangle one, two, three, four, and five. Now, as opposed to what we were doing before, in other words, setting up left side endpoints where I would maybe move from the left side over to the right in each case, or a right side endpoint which moves from the right side over to the left, I'm going to take exactly a point right in the middle. And to emphasize this, we can switch colors and show you what those would look like. So we're talking about a point right here. Eh, it would be nice if we could switch colors. We'll take a point halfway in the middle. Doesn't seem to want to switch colors on me. Let's try it now. And we'll identify what each one of these particular positions is going to be. Forgot my initial right side of that last rectangle. Well, clearly we can see that if our width uh, of each, uh, I'm sorry, if our entire distance across the x-axis is 2, b minus a, of course, is going to be 2. And if we divide that by how many subintervals we're dealing with, which we know to be 5, we come up with the fact that the width of each rectangle is two-fifths. However, that is only mildly helpful because we are going to be dealing with what is the value halfway across. From zero to two-fifths, what is that value of x? And it doesn't take a lot of thinking to come to the conclusion that it is, of course, one-fifth. And if we continue that same philosophy through the other four rectangles, we should come up with one-fifth, three-fifths, five-fifths, or one, seven-fifths, and then lastly, nine-fifths. Now, I think the easy part. Because when we talk about finding the area of a rectangle, we are dealing with the length times the width. And I want to note that this is an approximation, so the area would not be exactly equal to, but only approximately equal to, because if I were to actually take a look at what these rectangles look like, and for the purpose of this example, I'll go ahead and draw all five of these in very quickly. When we see where the rectangle, or where the dashed line, rather, hits the curve, that will become the place where I will draw the horizontal that will sort of cap off the rectangle. Kind of missed a little bit there. And you will see in certain cases I may have to extend the right side up to meet. So I am going to be finding the area of each of these guys. So if I were to color in the results, it would look something like this. Okay, trying to stay in the lines as best I can. So we will essentially be finding the area of this yellow stuff and you'll notice that in certain instances that, oh goodness, we might be sort of lacking a particular area at the expense of gaining a little extraneous area, but that's okay because the philosophy with this is that those two areas will, as you can probably imagine, tend, tend to balance each other out a little bit. I am not suggesting that they balance each other out exactly and that this is a true, true definition or an exact depiction of the area under the curve because it is not with a, a curve such as this. Hence is the reason why I still use the approximately equal to. Now we know that the area of any particular rectangle is length or width times length. 
So if we look at the width of each of these rectangles, remember that two-fifths that we had? It still is our width. We have a situation here where each rectangle has uh, a uniform width. That isn't always the case, as you will see in, in some later videos in section 4.3, but for right now we're using an equal width. And then we would just utilize the function, the function f of x, that will help us determine how tall each of these rectangles are. You know, we want to figure out how tall is this first rectangle. We want to know what is this ordered pair right there, or I'm sorry, what is that y value up there? The ordered pair is going to sort of come into play because the x value is going to be one-fifth. What is the y value? That truly tells us what that length is, and that's determined by just simply plugging in your one-fifth into your expression negative x squared plus 5. And you continue this process with each of those midpoints that we found. The three-fifths, the one, the seven-fifths, and the nine-fifths. You may want to double-check, count, one, two, three, four, five. We do have all five rectangles accounted for. And now the rest of this is just manipulation in the function. I'm going to go ahead and finish. But as you can imagine, you would just enter the negative one-fifth in for the x, and we have negative one-twenty-fifth plus five. That would be our first expression. To that, we shall add negative nine-twenty-fifths plus five. Now, we have a little break here because plugging in one is pretty easy. Negative one plus five is just four. The seven-fifths would give us negative forty-nine twenty-fifths plus five. And lastly, if I can just squeeze it in here, negative eighty-one twenty-fifths, okay, plus five. Okay, now that that is all taken care of, the next order of a business just uh, requires uh, quite a bit of arithmetic. Uh, and I'll go ahead and walk this uh, through with you. Uh, the key is going to be uh, to obtain a denominator that is the same, and it's pretty obvious that 25 will be that denominator. So you can see that we've got a little bit of work to do with, with these fives, but luckily each constant that we see, at least in four of these places, happens to be the same number five. And with a little bit of work, it might be obvious that 125 over 25 is what we're looking for. So that being said, if you take 125 over 25 and subtract 121 over 25, we would have 124 over 25. And we do the same here, 125 minus the 9 would be 116 over our 25. Luckily, the 4 is a little easy to work with. 100 over 25 would work there. And our second to the last term, 125 minus 49 is 76. And uh, the 125 subtract 81 in this instance. 125 minus 81 is 44, I believe. And then from this point, you just simply add the numerators together. And we would see along the way, 124 and 116 would be 240, 340, 340 added to 76 at this point, making sure we don't make any mistakes. That would be 416. And then 416 added to 44 would end us at 460. 460. And of course, you could uh, do a little bit of uh, reduction with this, I suppose. Um, the 5 and the 460 seem to do a little reducing. 5 would go into 46 nine times with one left over. 5 goes into 10 evenly twice. And it seems like we uh, um, won't be able to do a heck of a whole lot more with, with that. Uh, 92 times uh, 2 would be 184 over 25. And uh, nothing wrong with leaving the answer like that, I suppose. It's reduced about as much as we can reduce it. Uh, we could certainly uh, change it to a decimal. We might look at that here in just a bit. 
But that seems to be our answer using the midpoint rule approximation. Here's a program from the TI Inspire calculator. This is a, a great little program that um, a, a friend of mine had written. His name is Sean Bird from Covenant Christian High School uh, here in Indianapolis, where you can enter the function negative x squared plus 5 and, and state the intervals over which you are analyzing it. And that would be from 0 to 2. And with the handy little plus and minus down here, he has this set up so that you can um, change the number of subdivisions. Of course, we want five, as you can see over here. And you've got the ability to zoom in or zoom out if need be. And it's really kind of fascinating because you can actually see the different rectangular uh, approaches. Uh, in this particular case, we're going with the red option, which is the midpoint, which gives us an answer of 7.36. And if we recall from our document, from our uh, Word document here, 184 over 25, uh, let's say if we can go to a scratch pad here and say, well, what is 184 divided by 25? Uh, look, believe it or not, it's 184 over 25, but if I approximate it, I get the 7.36, which is exactly what we see here. So it is a handy little tool, the Riemann sum program, uh, written by Sean Bird that went help verify the answers when we do the approximations with left, rights, trapezoids, and in this case, the midpoint rule.